Hello, my name is Nigel Griffiths. I work for IBM at Advanced Technology Support in Europe. This session is about the M1 Advanced Topics. This is part four. And we're starting at number 10, Topaz Reports. And you might be thinking, Topaz? What's Topaz? Well, for the M1 for AIX, the code was merged into together with the Topaz command. So there's one binary, and depending on the name you use, it will either behave in N1 mode or in Topaz mode. But did you know you can even flick between these two modes if you use the little tilde character, and you can flip between the two. For example, here they are. Is if you're working in N1 and N1 mode, you hit the tilde character, it will flip to the Topaz mode. Sometimes the Topaz mode has some better stats or a better way of looking at things, particularly from a VIO server. But of course. Everybody knows that. That's not advanced. Uh, that's not what we're talking about for number 10. Here, if you're running it on AIX and you run into a performance problem, and then support asks you, have you got the performance stats for a week ago when it was running nicely? So we can compare and contrast to what's happening now. And then you think, oh no, we forgot to switch on Nmon and collect the stats. We have no stats. But ah, yes, you do. Now, if you installed AIX in something like the last 10 years, that's a bit of a guess on my part, but quite a long time, then it automatically starts up Topaz capturing performance reports every five minutes. They go into slash var, slash perf, slash daily, and there's the last seven days worth of data is captured there. Um, it will delete the oldest one as it starts the, the new one up for the new day. Now, these are binary files. Don't go editing them. You have to convert them to something usable. There's various formats, and you use the topaz out command to convert the binary into a normally a text file. But the minus A option is called nmon format. Notice the double quotes in that. So you just run that, and then you look in your local directory, and you'll find a CSV file in there. It says it's N1 format, but I don't think it's N1 format. It's sort of slightly about right. Loads of formatting's wrong. Some of the stats are different. Uh, I don't think you'll ever get that to go through the analyzer. So I thought, I, well, I actually had a large German bank that had a lot of data, and they wanted to analyze the Topaz data. So I took the Nmon chart that understands the Nmon files and hacked it about to understand the Topaz data. And so we have a Topaz chart command. It gives you similar uh, graphs to the Nmon chart. If you then use the Topaz chart in here instead of Nmon chart, um, you'll actually get a web page like you can with Nmon chart, and you can see all the graphs. You download that again from the Nmon for Linux web page. At the bottom here, we have N1 running with all these nice lines around boxes. It took me ages of programming to get that to work uh, properly. But when you try it, you might find all these Qs and Ks and XXs around the side. Um, or these days, I've actually find these sort of hash board things. I don't know what they are really. Now, let me express it just once. This is not... Edmond's fault. What you're doing here is you're telling the computer that you have a particular terminal connected. Now you don't actually have a terminal connected, you have a virtual terminal or a terminal emulator attached to it and that is set up wrong. So if you're on uh, Linux, set the term equals Linux. That can sort out a lot of problems in one go. If you're using PuTTY, then check the translation field down in here and switch it between UTF-8 and ISO-8859. Don't ask me what that means, uh, but that seems to sort out a lot of the problems. If you're on an AIX and you're using an X term in here, that will come out in black and white. Um, but if you set it to AIX term, then those on-screen graphs will come out in color. It's pretty exciting. Do give it a go. This is one for the N1 for Linux now. I've tried to get the distributions in their repositories that actually have uh, N1. So in, if you're in Ubuntu, for example, you do sudo apt install N1 and it pulls it down, but it pulls down a two-year-old out-of-date version. Um, so for example, we're at 16K at the moment and it may pull down 14B or something. Um, which means it has loads of bugs we fixed in the past four or five years, um, and it has some of the newer stats we'll be missing in that version. It'll probably work for the basics, but you're actually missing out on a lot of stuff. We looked at the 10 utilization stats, didn't we? Well, that will be missing in that case. The same happens with Red Hat and Suzy. The problem the distributions have is that 
every programmer on the planet wants their lovely piece of code in the distribution but then they can't maintain a repository with half a million different packages in it so they rely on other people or even the developers to update the binaries that actually go into the repository and this is a bit of a chaos area to be honest um, each of the distros have different mechanisms for doing that for the um, power computers there's a power repository from IBM where the N1 is nicely up to date and they remind me every year that they want uh, the fresh version of N1 but if you are getting non current levels of Edmond for Linux then you can go download those from the N1 wiki website um, or you could compile your own if you've got a brand new something you know, Red Hat 8 comes out and there isn't one pre-compiled for Red Hat 8 well the Red Hat 7 one will probably work but no they've changed some libraries so it won't run so much for backward compatibility guys but you can if you have the C compiler installed and you get the cursors development library installed each of which should take you about a second then you go download the Edmon code it's one file find the make file find the closing match to your operating system and your hardware and it then you run the make command and it takes about two seconds to compile then you got a nice fresh copy that matches exactly your version of Linux and we're at number 13. Imagine if you got sent thousands of N1 files and you can't cope with graphing them all there, you'd be there for six months. My typical example would be I get a request to analyze all these N1 files and recommend a Power9 server for a server consolidation type exercise. So they've got 100 uh, LPARs or virtual machines out there. They're Power7 machines, the older machines. There's thousands of NPARs files for the last year, 36,000 of them. So you want to ask the person sending you this, when is your busy period? And most companies and industries know the two busy weeks of the year is here and so you can disregard the rest of the files. You may want to do spot checks on those other files once you find out which are the really busy machines. Then we're going to group the files into directories based on machine type. The idea here is that if all the machines in, a, in one particular type, you can work out the R perf rating for that particular model. I'll give an example here of a 760. Now once you've got them into a directory, use the nsum scripts to actually catch the data out of the files for you without you having to graph them. This is three simple corn shell scripts. Two of them are 50 lines of shell script and one of them 70 lines of shell script so they're quite small. There's one called nsum gen gives you things like the machine type model, the serial number, the amount of CPUs actually in the machine. Then there's n some CPU that gives you some key facts about the uh, CPUs and the setup and most importantly the cores that are being used. There's a min, a max and an average and I'm quite pleased with myself that in the shell scripts it actually works at the 95th percentile. This is probably the one you want to do for capacity planning. Just takes out those 5% of those peaks and the next one that's now on the top is the one that you're going to use to do your sizing. It does a similar thing for the memory as well. It gets the facts and how much is used. So here's an example. If you've got a directory full of one particular model of machine, run the n sum script. Uh, for all those Nmon files and this is the output so there's one line at the top in here which is the uh, the title line and then there's one line for each of the files that it can find in your directory hopefully they're all the Nmons for your busy day in here we have some sort of fascinating facts the virtual process account the entitlement and the VP to E ratio some of these numbers are very high they could tune these LPARs and actually get them to run more efficiently then we have things about the uh, CPU pool. We can see in here this machine has 11 cores that are actually not being used. And we have the weight and the caps, which are just interesting uh, facts in here. Then we have the total. This is used to check that this is not an Nmon file that only has one record in it or something. So you can see this one is a little bit suspect. Very, very low CPU use. In fact, it's so low you might decide to switch that off and see if anybody notices. Then we've got the min, the maximum, the average, um, and here's the, the 95th percentile. And you see that usually is quite a bit below the, the maximum, about a bit above the average is what you'd expect in these numbers. So here you'd actually um, use this 
95th percentile for server consolidation, you add up this column, let's say that's uh, 16 cores, you times it by the RPerf per core for this particular model, and then you know the CPU rating you're going to have to find for your Power 9 servers. All this is covered in more detail, and you can download uh, the scripts um, from my expert blog article. It's here with the same name as we have at the top. Um, fortunately, of course, the expert blog is currently on the developer works and that might be changing soon. So uh, go and have a look at that soon after the video comes out or find out where my expert blog ended up on the Internet. Lots of working examples in here and loading those comma separated values into a spreadsheet and then you can get the, the spreadsheet to actually do the math for you. Times it by the RPerf number and map that onto a modern machine. Next up, 14, um, you can limit Enmon to only look for disks of a particular name and processes with a particular name. Now, I think this is a particularly crazy idea because you could be missing the elephant in the room. Now, what I mean is this, this typically comes for somebody like perhaps a DB2 database administrator. And on a big um, virtual machine, they've got the database running. But there's a whole bunch of other things running in here, but they only want to focus onto the database. That's all they care about. So they can select the disks they want for their database, and we can have up to 64 disks named in here. Um, this is AIX only, I noticed when I was writing this slide. For AIX and Linux, we can limit the process names. There's a minus capital C in here, and you list the name. Alternatively, you could set the shell variables before you start Enmon for Enmon CMD command 0 to 63 is another way of doing it. The problem I have for this is that you can see what the database is doing in my example, but maybe um, you're loading data into the database from a disk that you haven't named in here, so like a temporary base or disk that you're using to take a data load from somewhere else and push it into the database. That might be going very slow because that temporary disk is very slight and you'll never notice it in the data now. Or you might find your, your DB2 sync processes are actually going very slow, but that's because there's some bunch of shell scripts looping on a mistake in the code and they're sapping all the CPUs on the machine and that makes your database go slow, but you can't see it now because you've stripped out all the other commands. More info and a reminder, you can find it in nmon-h. Number 15 is cleanly stopping N1. Now, if you've got a very large machine with uh, perhaps hundreds of disks and maybe thousands of processes, and you're collecting the data on all those, then it can take N1 um, a, a number of seconds to actually capture that data. Now, while it's doing that, if you run a kill minus 9 on it and stop it, then that last record is sort of partially complete. It may be stop halfway through the line of the, all the disk stats, for example. And when you push that through one of the tools that generates graphs, it could crash at that point saying, hang on, there's a funny line here. I was expecting 28 disks and there's two. And, and that all goes horribly wrong. Now, there are people like benchmarkers that when they start a benchmark, they don't know how long it's going to take. So they start it end one running collecting nice rapid data collection and um, when it finishes they want to then stop n1 but let's do it cleanly so we have a minus p option here and that outputs the pid of the process um, and um, we can capture that in this line in here so here's the actual command we're running the to start the end one in here put it in the uh, the bracket braces brackets and a dollar sign in here and that will actually run the command and return the value it comes out with which is the pid of the process and it saves it in a variable we can um, print out the the pid on later on this is how to cleanly stop it you do kill minus usr2 this is a signal called user2 to the process and one will capture that signal when it finishes the next snapshot it will then stop cleanly Nice way of doing it. This is called Ralph mode because I have a friend in America that runs all the big Oracle database tests that we run on the new, very latest processors. And he gets a, collects an awful lot of data and wants to keep all these uh, files down to a sort of minimum size. We can put in a, a minus R in here, and it just saves it in the N1 file. So if you're running a series of benchmarks with, I'm sure you're emulating 1,000 users, 2,000 users, and 3,000 users, you can put that into the N1 file. So you haven't got to remember, you know, when was it we ran the 200 user test? Was that 11? 
o'clock or 12 o'clock and getting the right file, you can actually find in the file a little bit of a, a note, if you like, of what you're actually testing in here and work out which file is which. You actually see it in here when you, if you look at the Enmon file, the AA line and run name will actually have this in here. So what's next for M1? Well, M1 is not going away. It's a very popular tool. Um, it is largely, though, functionally stable because we don't want to affect all the other tools that are used for graphing the data. What I'm spending my time on these days now is something called NJMON. The J in there stands for JSON format, which is a sort of more flexible, self-documenting style. If I find new stats, I can immediately put it into the JSON file and then it's pushed into the database. A NJMON has far more stats that's been collected in here, not just the ones we wanted for benchmarking from years ago. And we don't end up with hundreds of NJMON files. The data is pushed immediately into a time series database. Now we're playing about one called InfluxDB. There are other time series databases around. Two of the most popular ones are Elastic or Elastic Search, also known as the ELK stack. And there's another one called Splunk. They're the two popular alternatives that I've actually used. Now once we've got the data in there and we can then use uh, dynamic graphing tools and uh, templates or dashboards with a set of graphs on them and we use one called Grafana that can very rapidly pull the data out of InfluxDB and other databases too. And now Grafana allows you to say what happened uh, yesterday, what happened the last week, what happened the last month or the last six months and it'll immediately draw the graphs out of the database that all the data that you got set. And if you want a new graph um, then it's it's literally six clicks of the mouse and you've got a new graph and it will then scale that as well across the machines and then you can flick a button and you can look at different the same set of graphs but looking at different machines. Now I'm not going to cover any more about NJMON, there's two hours worth of uh, videos out there already on YouTube and I'm about to make uh, another one. You can actually use NMON data too and put that into Inflex databases and use Grafana but I strongly recommend you use the NJMON tool because then we don't have to make the NMON files and move them around the computer room and load them up, we can do that all dynamically on the fly. Okay, that was part four. We covered lots of smaller items in my advanced list in here, then covered the what next, something you might try in the future. Please give us a thumbs up, it gives us good ammunition for spending the time creating more videos, and don't forget to subscribe and you'll be immediately told when I release my next video. Thanks for watching.